Okay guys, today we're going to talk a little bit about evolution and the fossil record. And you see there before you a photo of a Galapagos uh, tortoise, one of the famous ones that old Charlie Darwin uh, wrote about in his uh, journey on the Beagle. Now I know that uh, you guys have talked about evolution quite a bit uh, because you had biology. If you've had it here at East, you've had oh, probably a good month of uh, discussion about how this whole process operates and just how fundamental it is to everything we understand about biology. And since studying the fossil record is studying past biology, well, it pretty much has everything to do with uh, the fossil record. So uh, what I want to do, I don't want to go into the basics again, but I want to kind of hit on some of the parts of this process that are really unique that maybe we didn't get to talk about in biology quite so much um, that have a huge effect on how organisms have changed and adapted through time in the fossils. So uh, let's dive in here and we'll do a real short review just to refresh and then we'll just kind of get into some of the more uh, meaty stuff. So evolution, remember, uh, is defined as a change in a population or a species over time. Uh, remember the fact that single individuals do not and never do evolve. So you can stand on top of a building your entire life and flap your arms you are not going to evolve wings. Don't try and jump off, it ain't gonna work at no time, nowhere. Now, if you've got a hang glider, that's a different story, but uh, humans have managed to adapt to our environment by building things rather than uh, simply just developing new features sometimes. So that's kind of interesting. But by and large, uh, just keep in mind that evolution is a change in a population or a whole species over time, um, not an individual. Uh, so. Uh, we'll get a little bit more into that as we go. There's a giant ground sloth there for you. Uh, so uh, lots of changes have happened in the fossil record. And one of the things that we'll notice as we look at the fossil record is that changes from organisms to get larger or smaller uh, seems to be a pretty simple thing in comparison to developing an entire new feature altogether. So you have things like the ground sloth, uh, which uh, became greatly reduced in size in the present day. You have other creatures like the horse, which became much, much larger um, in the present, present day. So you can really see this a lot in the fossil record. Uh, and so it must, there must be some simple method or, or simpler methods for organisms to change in size versus uh, completely creating brand new features. So we'll talk some about that as we go here. Now, we know that organisms adapt to their environments and these adaptions uh, are basically the end result of evolutionary changes. Uh, what an adaptation is, is a specialized feature that allows an organism, whether it's an animal or a plant, to somehow excel in its environment. Um, and as we're gonna find out here momentarily, uh, adaptations aren't perfect. They're, most of the time, they're just good enough to get by, um, and then the evolutionary pressures aren't there anymore. But looking at the Venus flytrap, what a tremendous adaptation to be able to capture animals and dissolve their nutrients in order to extract nitrogen from them when you live in nitrogen poor soils like bogs. Uh, we can look at the teeth of carnivores versus herbivores. In the picture there, you've got a picture of a, I think it's a horse skull on the right there, and then some sort of a carnivore on the left. So uh, you can tell just based on the teeth uh, that these creatures uh, have adapted to their environment. Now, I want to point this out because we're going to come back to it, but the adaptation of a jaw that opens and closes with these grasping and, and cutting objects called teeth in it, comparing that to the adaptation of this plant that opens and closes what very much so appears to be a jaw and little dangly bits there that appear to be teeth-like uh, are actually quite different. And it's a really important point. We'll come back to that here in a second. Let's just review real fast uh, the basics of evolutionary theory. So the real basics uh, as we understand them today, and this goes somewhat far and beyond what, what Charlie Darwin uh, really truly understood, uh, because now we understand how genes work and how genetics works in terms of evolutionary change. Now, there's a mixing of genes in every creature that uh, does sexual reproduction. So in that respect, uh, you as an individual are a mixing of the genes that were in your parents, right? Now remember, 
those genes that you have don't have to be genes that were necessarily expressed in your parents. Um, they could have been, they, they, maybe they weren't the dominant genes, maybe they were recessive, and they're expressed in you because you know, maybe dad had a recessive and mom had a recessive, and now you express that characteristic because you have two recessive genes. Uh, this is one of the reasons that uh, we kind of abhor and, and we don't like the idea of people who are too closely related mating, right? I mean, everybody knows we say that, and immediately your, your, your mind is like, ooh, that's just disgusting, right? But one of the reasons that we find that disgusting is that we have evolved or, or at least recognized the fact that when two siblings or two individuals that are very close genetically mate, uh, their offspring oftentimes have many, many problems, lots of genetic disorders. Well, as it turns out, a number of genetic disorders in humans are carried on those recessive genes. And if you mate two parents that are closely related, there's a bigger opportunity, a bigger chance that they're going to have a recessive gene and the, the child is going to get that recessive gene and not get one of the um, dominant genes. So uh, that's one of the reasons that we find that so gross. Um, now, part of this, part of the theory of evolution regards the fact that your genes, your chromosomes, they, they mix up. So your, your genes get shuffled in sexual reproduction. Um, and, and that's a really important thing for giving us new variation. Now that doesn't create a brand new feature, does it? It just shuffles the features that you do have, which sometimes having one feature with another feature can be really useful. Maybe having one type of hair color with a different type of height is a really useful thing for an organism. So that shuffling provides a tremendous amount of variation in and of itself. I mean, evolution can act on those variations. You know, maybe it could completely wipe out um, a particular gene altogether. So uh, other parts to this are that, uh, remember, you, you, in sexual reproduction, there's an egg and there's a sperm. And each of those is carrying exactly half of the genetic code. It's carrying just one set of chromosomes. And then those will, will combine to yield all these different variations. Now, uh, if mutations occur, in that sperm or that egg, or in the formation of it, like when the DNA is copied, uh, those can then go on to give us variability, to give us differences, like to give us brand new genes altogether. Now looking at this all kind of holistically, we can sum it all up and talk about what we call a gene pool, which is the sum total of genetic components for a specific population. So as a population of, say, sparrows living in some region of North America, they have a certain amount of types of genes. They have genes for certain feather color. They have genes for certain feather length, for a certain size, all sorts of different genes. And how, what frequency those genes appear in the population, well, that's the type of thing that we call the gene pool. Okay, so uh, in, in other words, like sometimes you have two different uh, groups of organisms that might be able to mate but sometimes there's a barrier that limits their mating. And so that gene pool can sort of shrink and you might get some very different features out of one gene pool of organisms versus another, even though they were originally related to each other, which can give rise to what we call speciation. So speciation is actually our term for the origin of a brand new species from two or more individuals of a pre-existing species. So it's not just like poof, here's a new species, individuals from a pre-existing, from a species that's already here, uh, start to look more and more different because the gene pool changes, possibly. And then over time, you can end up with a completely new species that looks totally different from the original species. Now, this process is so slow most of the time that you're not going to notice it. The change is very gradual. So at any point in time, if you look at a population, they're going to look like the rest of the population. It's not going to be like, oh, look, that one over there just grew some wings. It's totally different now, right? It, it's usually going to be like that. Now, there are some cases where evolution can proceed so rapidly that it is like, wow, bam, there's a brand new looking creature um, or, or a creature that's so different it can't mate with the old ones and we call the new species. So we'll talk a little bit about some of that as we go here. But I want to turn now back to 
this incredibly interesting plant called the Venus flytrap. So the Venus flytrap has an interesting lesson for us. Uh, when we compare how it operates and what it looks like, what, how it appears to be, sorry, we've got the bells, with uh, how uh, the jaw and the mouth of a mammal looks or other types of creatures look, um, it's, it's really incorrect. It really shows us how incorrect it is to view evolutionary change as that there's some designer who's taking raw materials and then forming a creature out of those raw materials to look a certain way, to be a certain way. So uh, if, if that were the case, you would grab the best possible materials to create whatever you were creating, right? Um, and oftentimes it does look like things are, are almost perfect. Uh, if you look closer, you find that they're really not. Um, we'll talk about that here in a second, but let's turn back to the flytrap here. It has this thing that looks an awful lot like a jaw. Um, now, it's, it's not a jaw. Why? Well, it doesn't have muscles. It doesn't operate in the same way uh, that a mammal jaw would happen to operate. In fact, uh, why doesn't the Venus flytrap have teeth? Uh, it doesn't have teeth because teeth are made of this material known as dentin and enamel. And, and those proteins, those, those things, are not found in plants. So evolution really operates as a way of changing, most of the time, changing pre-existing features, uh, modifying them to give us something new. And the Venus flytrap is not at all a jaw. The appendage that you see there is actually a modified leaf. So the, the jaw-like structure is really truly just a leaf. And the way that it opens and closes has everything to do with the plant's changes in osmotic pressure of the cells, which is something entirely different than muscles. Right? Now, why didn't it evolve muscles? Why didn't it just go ahead and evolve enamel and dentin and those, those things that are, like it would be really useful if that thing could chew up its food, right? It'd grind it up some, could get more nutrients out of it. It could even probably be faster than it is if it had muscles and, and teeth. Um, those things didn't evolve in plants, uh, not because they wouldn't be useful, but because the, the materials to evolve them from weren't already present in the plants. So I hope you can kind of see how evolution really operates based on changing features, changing proteins, changing DNA that's already there in the organisms to begin with. Now that's not to say that something completely new can't arise, but the likelihood of that is just incredibly rare um, as opposed to just changing a feature that's already there, right? So let's consider this in terms of uh, two different ways of looking at it. Is evolution doing more of a remodeling or is it a completely brand new reconstruction? When we look at evolution in, in light of the Venus flytrap and in the jaw of mammals, we can see that it's really more of a remodeling process. It's not a let's just build a creature from scratch sort of thing. You've got all these adaptations in different organisms. Well, they're not perfect. The Venus flytrap doesn't have teeth. It doesn't have muscles. It's not as fast as it, it could be if it had those things. Uh, humans aren't, I mean, we seem pretty perfect, but there's a lot of problems, right? Uh, we've got issues with things like our knees getting bad. Our shoulder joints are not great. We have back problems. Why do we have a lot of those things? Because we evolved the features that we do have from ancient ancestors that didn't necessarily walk upright, that didn't necessarily use the features that we have today in the same way we did. And so a lot of those features, uh, they changed, they evolved through time to be just good enough, and believe me, they're really good, uh, to get us by with what we need to do. Um, if they weren't, we wouldn't be here, right? But at the same time, they're not perfect. Like there's a lot of stuff we could do to make our knees and our backs better than they are um, and to not have the problems that we have. Um, and, and sometimes surgically we do do that, right? Um, so a, a species might develop a useful feature, but the evolution of that feature, it's constrained by the structure of the ancestors. Uh, 
Uh, it's not like, poof, there's this brand new thing. You're not going to wake up in the morning and then, poof, there's some wings, right? Well, well, first of all, we don't even create some of the proteins that would be necessary to make wings. Um, now, uh, really, if you just remember, evolution operates by changing what's already present. Let's take a look now at some, some embryos. And you've probably seen pictures like this. I know we show them in biology. Um, we talk about, you know, can you tell which organism is which? Because when you look at, their, look at them as embryos, when they're inside the egg or inside mom, uh, they look ridiculously similar. Like, it, like it's scary even. When you look at them, though, as they grow a little bit more and a little bit more, they start to look a little bit more different. So once they become adults or near adults, they start to look really different. And now you can really see some differences here. Maybe some of you knew right off the bat. Um, I sure as heck wouldn't, uh, looking at that first line there, which one was going to be uh, the human versus which one was going to be, you know, the turtle. Uh, they look pretty darn similar, don't they? So when we look at comparative embryology, we can see, first of all, that uh, things like vertebrates, we share a common ancestor. Every one of these creatures that has a backbone there is some serious common ancestry here, and we know we trace that all the way back to the fishes. Like, like that, it, goes, it goes right back to the fish where we see those backbones, and then right up to present, and you can see the formation of the four-leg situation there right on up to modern-day human. So uh, why are the embryos so similar? Well, it's because we do share a common ancestor. And even vertebrates share common ancestry if you want to go back far enough uh, with things like insects and everything else on the planet, right? So uh, the question could be asked, and of course it has been, why is it that an embryo can look so similar, but the adults look so darn different? And there's actually a very good evolutionary reason for this. The reason is that as an embryo, when you're inside mama or you're inside the eggy, you or whatever creature we're talking about is really sheltered from the external world, right? You don't have to worry about the weather. You don't have to worry about, you know, things coming and eating you. Um, not that, like, that's something that you necessarily worry about, but those factors that would affect you that would select against your inability to run fast or your inability to be a certain color or your inability to blend in, they don't affect you. You're sheltered from that world by a shell or by mom. So the selective pressures that evolution acts on, they don't really exist. So changes happening in embryos have been very, very gradual throughout time, throughout geological history. Uh, it doesn't mean that they don't happen. It just means that there's not really a pressure pushing organisms to be different in the embryo form. Now, as an adult, there needs to be some very big differences for organisms to adapt to their environment. So kind of when does that happen and, and, and how does it occur? How do you go from one thing that's so similar to something that's so darn different? Well, we're going to talk about that here in a second. But really, it's the selective pressures that are occurring that cause the, the changes, cause the selection of the DNA. Okay, and, and remember, it's not that the DNA doesn't already exist in that embryo. It's there. It's just that the parts of it that code for the embryo shape, they're not selected for or against. The parts of it that are going to code for the adult, those will be selected for in the adult. So let's turn now to something called a vestigial structure. And you might remember these from biology class. They're pretty unique. I just wanted to put them in here because uh, they're sort of fun. But a vestigial structure is any, any structure that an organism has uh, that really doesn't serve the original purpose or, or maybe even a purpose at all in the creature that has it. And we can trace that back to an evolutionary history. So I put some examples up here and just to show you, there are some snakes that still have leg bones. And I think this is a ball python here. And it's, we call them spurs, these little dangly bits. And those are attached inside to actual bones. The snake has no need to have bones inside of its body that are legs. Why are they there? Because its ancient ancestors, other lizard-like creatures, had four legs. Snakes lost them over time. 
So some snakes still retain that vestigial leg structure. How about another one? The whale. Whales have a lot of features. Um, one feature they have is the pelvic girdle. Now a pelvis is useful for supporting your body on land, but whales don't live on land, do they? Right? But remember, whales are mammals, so part of their history is they evolved from creatures that used to live on land. Creatures that looked an awful lot like dogs in, in many respects. Um, they weren't dogs. Uh, but anyway, they still have that characteristic, uh, as do all land mammals, of having a pelvic girdle, a pelvis to support them. You don't need that in, land, uh, in the water. You don't need to support your body that way. Let's turn to humans. Humans have all kinds of bizarre vestigial structures. Uh, one of them is the tiny surrounding muscles that, that many of us still have that we can actually, some of us can still flex and wiggle our ears. Some of you might be able to do that. So that's vestigial because other mammals that have those same exact muscles, only larger, have complete control over their ears. Think about your cat, how it can turn its ear and cock it one way or the other to pick up sounds better. Uh, humans have no more need for that. and We've lost the ability to move those ears around. Now, could some of our ancient ancestors? I don't know. How far back do you want to go? I honestly don't know the answer to that question. Um, other vestigial structures, another noticeable one in humans that you might have broken before and recognize that it was really a pain in the butt, oh, I get it, is a tailbone. Uh, you don't have a tail that you can wiggle. Now, now, some humans are actually born with a little nub, and they'll cut that off after birth, uh, a little tail nub. But uh, if you break your tailbone, you, you know that thing's largely useless. There's little bones left over um, because our ancient ancestors did have tails. Um, now, don't think about Neanderthals running around with a the tail. They didn't have tails, right? Um, you'd have to go back pretty far uh, to find something that had a tail. But uh, if, if we do look at that, yeah, we're related to other vertebrates and other vertebrates that had tails. Okay, let's turn now to another unique part of evolutionary change, evolutionary change specifically caused by humans. Humans have been muddling around with evolution for, for quite some time, even before we recognized that it was a thing, but we've been selectively breeding certain organisms to promote certain types of DNA in them uh, to create what we want to create. Uh, just looking at dogs, all modern dogs share the wolf as the ancestor. Uh, a wolf will eat you, right? Wolves are dangerous, mean, nasty things. Uh, but through breeding and over time, we've created things like the Pomeranian. What? The, the little little hot dog looking dog. Like, what, why? Like, what's the purpose of that? It's because we like the way it looks. We like the way it behaves. We, we created these things. We've created all sorts of things for our purposes. We've created every different plant you see up here. Everything from kale to cauliflower came from the exact same plant, the wild mustard. Wild mustard is still around today, so are wolves. Um, we just selectively bred it for certain characteristics to give us things that were tasty or at least nutritious. Um, you may not think that cabbage and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts are tasty, but uh, we, we made these plants out of the wild mustard. Um, another one we made was corn. We made corn. Um, out of a plant called teosinte. Teosinte is the picture on the far left. It's this tiny little plant, not very big. Um, and you can see some of the evolutionary stages up there to modern corn. Um, it's still around today, um, but the Native Americans bred that stuff to make corn. Very useful plant, right? Especially for those of us who live in Indiana. Finally, I want to leave you with this one, uh, which is just bizarre. But yeah, just because maybe we can do it Maybe we shouldn't, I don't know, but we made some pretty weird things like this type of cattle right here. Uh, this is a Belgian blue cattle. Uh, yes, this is a real photo. There's lots of photos. You could look them up on the internet. They are some creepy looking critters. That is a monstrous cow right there. What we did was we started breeding for a specific mutation that occurs in cattle. And it's a mutation that causes double muscle growth. So these things have two times the muscle of any other cow. Uh, why did we want that? Well, because we kill them and eat the muscle meat, right? Um, now, I don't remember, but I think that maybe these aren't as tasty as a, as a regular cow, so maybe they're not as high, of, high in demand, but uh, we can do it 
And we do, right? And today, in modern day, we're genetic engineering things, which is pretty unique, right? We can completely genetically engineer a creature uh, and make it better for us. We can make it safer. Um, now, are there dangers present in that? Yeah, we've got to be careful with it, right? But by and large, we shouldn't be afraid of genetically modified crops. I know you've heard all kinds of horror stories about GMOs. But in many ways, making uh, crops capable of growing uh, under adverse conditions like in deserts and things like that has been very helpful for parts of the world where you can't grow crops for feeding people who are starving. Um, it's very helpful when you can knock out the genes in, say, potatoes that are cancerous when you fry them. It's very helpful if you can, you know, knock out the genes that are bad cholesterol in, say, pigs because everybody likes bacon, right? So we've been doing that stuff. It's not that we don't need to be careful. We do. But I think that by and large, there's a lot of like fear mongering that goes on with this that, that we need to just get over. Like we figured it out where we're doing this stuff. We've been doing it for a long time. So let's look at mutations. Mutations are the way we get new genes. So much, much of the variability that we uh, achieve in natural selection uh, comes from mutations. How do you get a different hair color that's never before existed in a creature? Uh, a gene mutates, and this happens pretty frequently. Um, how do genes mutate? Well, they can be errors when we're doing DNA replication. There can be mutations from cosmic radiation, which is hitting us all the time. UV light causes mutations, which leaks into our Earth's atmosphere, right? Exposure to chemicals. There's lots of ways mutations occur. They, they do. We know for a fact, right? Bad mutations can cause cancer. So these are the things that natural selection operates on. Now, there's some different thoughts about evolution that I want to kind of take a look at. One is that uh, you might have learned in school that evolution takes millions and millions of years. Now, that's not always the case. Uh, that's how Darwin conceived of it. He thought of gradualism, where species change very slowly over time. because, of, And we understand that that does occur, right? Slow accumulations of genetic mutations and selection pressures result in slightly different proteins. And over millions of years, you can have some very different looking things. Um, now. I don't know if I should have said there's a problem with this, but the, the fact is that most mutations are not necessarily helpful. Um, they're either not harmful at all, or they are bad and they're dangerous, right? So just because there's a mutation doesn't mean that you have evolutionary change, right? Um, a lot has to happen for that to get passed onwards. But yeah, we all have mutations, differences in our DNA from our parents and our ancestors. Now, um, here's a little Chucky e. D there. Now, uh, we could look at, say, something like uh, oysters, an evolution of oysters. So these are Jurassic uh, coiled oysters that uh, evolved over tens of millions of years to the flat ones that we have today. So very slow, gradual changes that occurred over time. Absolutely, truly does happen, right? Um, you can look there at the bottom picture. You have that, they're like kind of a coiled looking toenail sort of a shell. And they're much flatter today. And that happened due to some of the changes that were in the environment at the time with the mud and things like that there in the bottom of the ocean. Okay, So uh, evolution can and does take millions of years to occur. But it can also occur pretty fast geologically. And one thing that can make that happen is something called a Hox gene. And I wanted to talk about these because they're really pretty unique. Hox genes are regulatory genes. So not all genes simply just code for a type of protein, like this is going to give you a hair color or a wing length or something like that. Some genes switch on and off other genes, specifically at certain times, like during development. And if you switch a gene on at a time that's earlier or later than it's used to being switched on, you can get some really bizarro things happening. Right? In fact, you can prevent a gene from functioning at all. You can make it happen in a different part of the organism. Uh, you can totally change the entire shape of the organism. It's some real weird stuff. Now, most, ver most invertebrates have like 12 or fewer of these Hox genes kind of clustered on a single chromosome. 
vertebrates have up to like 38 in four different clusters. So what's some of the complexity we've seen in the changes in life on our planet? Undoubtedly, it's been in the duplication of these Hox genes. Errors in replication where you get a duplicate of a gene, errors in crossing over where something gets duplicated um, can cause some massive changes in creatures. Um, so uh, some of the similarities, like looking at the picture there, we do have, like mice share some similarities with a fruit fly. Like, like their Hox genes, they do share some. They have some more, um, but there's definitely a common origin to these Hox genes. Um, and they've made major changes through time. Let's look at some that scientists have been able to trigger by purposely mutating Hox genes. It's pretty cool. So let's take a look here. Here's a fruit fly. Um, and scientists have been able to make some real weird stuff happen in these guys. Uh, for instance, uh, we've been able to uh, add an extra pair of wings. How about that? Right? We've been able to make legs grow out of their head. Well, that's pretty weird, right? We've been able to put eyes on the ends of their legs or even their wings simply by making one tiny little mutation. So can changes occur rapidly? Yeah, if the mutation occurs in the right gene and it's not fatal, uh, genetic change and evolutionary processes can happen rapidly, very, very rapidly. In fact, one of the ways that we understand that the addition of extra pairs of legs and segments in something like an arthropod occurred was by duplications and mutations in these Hox genes. One generation, wham, you can add an extra set of legs. You could add eyes on the ends of the legs, not that that would be useful, but you can have massive changes that occur very rapid evolutionarily um, just by a single mutation in a single gene. Take a look at this one here. Here's a normal fruit fly on the left, and here's a fruit fly that's had a Hox gene mutation where instead of an antenna, a leg it grew out of its head. Weird stuff, right? Now, I'm not saying that these aren't going to be fatal sometimes, but some of these mutations could make a major change and be a huge adaptation, a huge use. Here's a, uh, another picture of that same thing with the leg growing out of the antenna there. Pretty creepy, isn't it? Here's a picture of a fruit fly with eyes. Take a look at those red dots. They've been stained on the ends of its legs. Creepy, right? So evolution doesn't have to happen slow. It can happen pretty rapidly. The changes can occur quickly. It depends on where the mutation is. It depends on the selective pressures. Um, it depends on a lot of different factors. Anyway, I just wanted to kind of give you that today and talk a little bit about how uh, some of the unique parts of evolutionary change. That's it for today. You can answer your quiz and you're all done.